Funding for In the Garden is provided by UNC TV members and by Academic Programs and North Carolina Cooperative Extension. Both are members of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at North Carolina State University. Hi, and welcome to In the Garden. I'm Bryce Lane. Can you imagine being able to garden in the dead of winter? Well, folks, today's show is all about home greenhouses, cold frames, and overwintering structures. Now, why would anyone in North Carolina want to have a home greenhouse? After all, home greenhouses can be quite costly to build, to heat, and to maintain. Folks, if you're going to be involved with a home greenhouse, you've really got to have a major commitment to it because it requires a lot of time and attention. Well, there are a lot of advantages to having a home greenhouse that might justify all that time and attention. One of the first advantages to having home greenhouse is that it increases your growing space. We only have limited indoor space that we could use to grow plants. And by having a home greenhouse, you can extend that space and you can grow a number of different plants. So that would be the first reason to have one would be to, to do that. And in fact, what a lot of people do that have home greenhouses is they can force plants into flower in their home greenhouse and then bring them inside and decorate them in the home where they wouldn't be able to do that normally. Now the second reason you'd have a home greenhouse would be that it extends the growing season. Could you imagine having tomatoes in the middle of winter that came from your own greenhouse? Well you can do that. You really get an extension of the, of the growing season, especially during the colder months where you're able to grow plants that you would not be able to grow outdoors normally. So there's your second reason. Now the third reason is one of my favorites and that is you've got space to make more plants. This becomes a propagation unit and you can do a number of things like propagate seeds for your vegetable garden early or take cuttings of different plants and propagate them, give them away and add them to your garden during the normal season. So there's the third reason. The fourth reason is kind of a personal one and that is it gives you a place to play during the winter when the temperatures are cold and the wind might be blowing. This gives you a place to go inside and actually do some horticulture during those months when you normally wouldn't be able to. Of course, the last reason to have a home greenhouse would be to grow plants that you wouldn't be able to grow in your home. The light intensity isn't bright enough in the home or the temperature's just not right, and this gives you an opportunity to manipulate the environment and grow certain plants. Now, the one thing you want to consider, too, with a home greenhouse in North Carolina is it's not so much the cold you need to be concerned with as much as it is the warm temperatures in the spring, summer, and fall. And so ventilation is something we'll be talking about. Now the second thing we want to identify relative to our home greenhouses is the type of home greenhouse you would have. I'm not talking about the style or the structure. We're really talking about the minimum night temperature during the winter time. There are four basic categories. The first type of house is called a cold house. Now a cold house home greenhouse is a greenhouse that has no heating whatsoever. And during those cold winter uh, nights, it could possibly get down to freezing or below. So the plants that you'd have in that greenhouse would not be anything that would not be able to tolerate freezing temperatures. The second is called the cool house. Now a cool house may be the one you'd want to shoot for, especially in North Carolina. The temperature at night minimum temperature 42 to 45 degrees. And what that does is it enables you to grow a number of plants, including tomatoes, have them flower and even fruit during the winter time. Third is called a warm house. And the minimum night temperature is 55 degrees. And that would allow you to grow some tropical plants and some exotic plants in there. But remember, the cost of heating that greenhouse, it might be prohibitive. And that leads us to the last one where the cost really to heat the house is tough. And that's called the hot house. That would be where the minimum night temperature is 65 degrees or higher. You'd be able to grow some great tropicals in there, but the cost might be prohibitive. So those are the four different types of greenhouse uh, relative to temperatures that you might want to consider. And I think the cool house may be the one you want to go with. Now it's probably time for us to actually go into this greenhouse, talk about how it was built, and look at some of the factors that are in it. 
Well, we're in the home greenhouse of Helen and Greg Krauss. And Helen is a lecturer in the Department of Horticultural Science at NC State University. And Helen, I know this um, greenhouse is something that you use quite a bit, and uh, you've talked to me a lot about it. How about telling us a little bit about how big it is and what it's made out of? Well, Bryce, it's 8 feet wide and it's 16 feet long. And we built it as a lean-to off mm -hmm. of our shop. Okay, and that's a, the south-facing wall, so right. it faces south. Then. Right. Okay. It's built out of pressure-treated lumber, mm -hmm. uh, and Greg and I built it. It took about two weekends to build and, and what was the estimated cost? About $1,500, not counting labor since we did it. So that's a big it. financial commitment yeah, as yeah. well as time. Well, you know, let's talk about the glazing material. Now, we use the term glazing to talk about what you put on the greenhouse to allow the sunlight through. Uh, what is this material? I know it's not glass and it's not polyethylene plastic. It's called a double-walled polycarbonate, mm -hmm. and it gives uh, the best insulative value. So it, it keeps the greenhouse the warmest, plus it lets a lot of light through uh, to, to be able to grow things in the wintertime better. Right. Well, it works very well. I know it's, it's got good insulation uh, factor there. Well, speaking of temperature, let's talk about heating. Um, I know that this greenhouse is a cool house, as, as I defined earlier, is that correct? Yes, yes. We try to keep the nighttime temperatures no lower than about 45 in okay. here. Okay, and how do you do that? We just use a space heater, mm -hmm. um, just, you know, as you would put in any home or room in your house. And it's operated on a thermostat, so it comes on when it gets too cool. Right. Oh, cool. Well, let's talk about um, the other side of heating, and that's cooling. Because right. in North Carolina, we really have a problem with that, with, right, the, with right. the summer heat. How do you ventilate in here? How do you cool it down? Well, in, in the summertime, we put shade cloth over to keep mm -hmm. some of the light intensity out. And then we have a vent, a fan behind us, and a vent on the op opposite end. And it's also operated on the thermostat. It comes on when the greenhouse gets to about 75 or 80. Mm -hmm. And it runs until the greenhouse cools off again. Okay. okay. So that's very crucial then, especially right. during the spring and fall, and obviously in the summer. Well, Helen, let's talk about the flooring in this greenhouse. I know oftentimes it's recommended that you put gravel in a home greenhouse, and I see that you have a landscape fabric or a weed fabric down on top, and what's the idea behind that? Well, I have gravel under the weed fabric, mm -hmm. but the landscape fabric gives me a nice clean surface that I can sweep uh, to get dirt up, and it gives me a good clean surface that uh, doesn't promote disease in the greenhouse. And you don't get any weed growth either. Right, then. right. And then you still maintain that high relative humidity. Right, right. Well, speaking of that high relative humidity, um, how does that impact when you put a lean-to green greenhouse up against a house rather than, say, a shop? Well, I don't feel comfortable with it. Uh, it is such high humidity. And you can see even here I have uh, RMAX board against the shop just to keep the moisture out of the shop. Of course, that also adds some reflectivity to help heat it right, up in the winter right. as well. Well, let's see. Water. You've got um, the hose set up for watering. How about fertility? I know fertility is real important. With the well, I use a dosatron, which is an injector, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a commercial injector. And uh, you don't have to have one of those for a greenhouse. I just happen to have one. Uh, you could also use what's called a hose-on, which mm -hmm. is just a small injector. Siphon injector. Right? Or right, right. It's uh, or you could just um, mix a dilute fertilizer and apply it with a watering cake. Well, tell us a little bit about what you use this space for, because obviously you use all the space. <laughs> Well, my husband and I uh, enjoy having fresh herbs and fresh tomatoes, and I'll grow lettuces and spinach in here. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so we bring those into the home for dinner. I enjoy having annuals, pots of annual plants that I can put around in the garden and then overwinter in here. And then I start lots of seeds and cuttings and things. Well, like I know. That. I've known you a long time, and I know you're all <laughs> about propagation and making more plants, so that's, that's really neat. Well, I get a little bit jealous when I come here and look at this because I think, boy, I'd love to have a home greenhouse, but I'll have to check with my wife on that first. <laughs> but, well, Helen, thanks for showing us around and telling us Thank about you for coming. Greenhouse. Well, a greenhouse is just one way to manipulate the environment around your plants. There's got to be some other ways that would be less expensive, perhaps not take up as much space, that we can use in our garden to extend the growing season and have a place to protect plants in the winter. Well, one of those ways is called a cold frame. Now, folks, a cold frame is used to insulate an area by using sunlight. Sunlight is the energy source for what warms this space. Now, this particular cold frame was purchased at about $100, and it's a structure that is, again, translucent to light. This is a corrugated plastic cover here that is on a hinge. 
see if I open it up you can see there's a space down inside. Now some of the things you want to remember about using a cold frame. One, you want to put it in a sunny location because it's using passive solar energy to heat this area. Secondly, we, what are we going to use it for? Well, like I said, it extends the growing season four to six weeks. So that means that we can place plants in here that would be damaged by cold temperatures and by putting them in the cold frame, they will be protected. Secondly, and this is what I like to use a cold frame for, is to harden off new seedlings and cuttings. Now, what do we mean by harden off? Well, if we've gone ahead and taken cuttings like these plectranthus and they've rooted and started to grow well in our home and in our greenhouse and we want to put them out into the landscape, it might be a little bit harsh on them to just place them immediately in the landscapes. So one of the things you can do, put them in the cold frame and that's kind of a tough love we're practicing with these new seedlings and with cuttings. We put them in here and it gets a little bit chillier at night as it does in the greenhouse and, or in your home and this helps to strengthen them, make them better able to make that transition into uh, um, the garden. The second reason we might use a cold frame would be to actually germinate some seeds. Look at this over here. Here are some seeds that have been planted in these particular containers and they need to be protected a little bit from the winter time but still have a cold exposure. And look at this. Here are some seeds that have germinated. This is a cyclamen and these have already started to germinate. So this particular plant, great example of how you can sow seeds, put them in the cold frame even through the winter and they'll go ahead and germinate and come out. And of course these are hardy plants that the seeds have germinated. And now you can keep this in the cold frame as well. Now folks, there are a couple things to remember about a cold frame is you always want to have good drainage. You want to have a place for that water to go and run off. And here you can see there's been some grates put in on this particular cold frame. The second thing is it's not so much heating that's the concern, it's if it gets too hot. So when you do have a warm day and it's sunny, that you'll see that this cold frame comes with a little bracket that uh, provides for ventilation. Key thing with a cold frame is have that ventilation. It's a great way to extend the growing season and grow more plants. So you think you might want to have your own cold frame, but you're not ready to spend the money to purchase one, or maybe you're not comfortable building one. Well, I'd like to show you a way that you can create a cold frame. Maybe it's temporary. You can try it one season, see how it works before you invest in a more permanent one. And you only need four bales of pine straw and a little bit of plastic. Let's take a look. I've got four bales of pine straw here, and that's going to be the basic unit for the cold frame. What you want to do is build it on on an open ground, a little bit of a slope to let the light in. I've placed some plants here to show where I'd like to have that cold frame be. And I'm going to put one bale of pine straw here, one here on the other side, butted right up against it, creating kind of a rectangle. I think you can begin to see how that's going to create the space for the cold frame here. And then with the fourth bale, we're going to place it right down here. We're going to have to pull this one in just a little bit. There we go. And folks, the pine straw works very well as the framing for the cold frame because it provides insulation as well as height. And so plants that are taller can go in here as well. You also get that air barrier and that air insulation from, from having the height there. So there you have it. Now what do you need? Well, we need glazing. Now if you have an old window sash, maybe in your crawl space, you could lay that across the top. Remember to pick it up and ventilate it when it gets warm. But if you don't even have a window sash, what else could you do? Well, you can use plastic. Now, not just any sort of plastic. This is a white polyethylene plastic, and it's a bit opaque, so it doesn't heat up too much in here with the sun coming through. You just cut a piece and place it over the top of the cold frame. So there's your glazing. You put it right over the top like that. It works out great and doesn't cost a whole lot of money. The only problem is it gets windy, the plastic may blow off. So you just use a little ingenuity, take a few rocks, place them to secure the plastic on the pine straw. There we go there. And then, of course, the fourth rock would come down here on the bottom. And there you have it. Now, the only thing you need to remember is if it does get warm, you need to ventilate. We always important to ventilate the different kinds of structures that we have. So how would you go about ventilating this particular cold frame? Just put, pick up this bottom rock, take this back like this, creating a little opening. You can re-secure the plastic with rocks on either side. And now you've got a little hole here for ventilation. Very inexpensive, easy way to create a cold frame and practice doing some gardening in that cold frame before you invest in something more permanent and more expensive.
Well, you know, there are lots of different ways to manipulate the environment around plants using greenhouses and cold frames, but that's primarily for growing plants. There are also some structures that you can use, temporary, that actually protect plants in the wintertime. Even hardy plants that are in containers can suffer damage when the weather gets very, very cold, especially during the night in the dead of winter. Temperatures get down to 15, 16 degrees, or even lower into single digits, and plants in pots' roots can be significantly damaged to the point where those plants would not grow. So we need to what we call overwinter those plants, protect them from the winter. Now you can dig a hole six to eight inches deep right up against the north side of your house, and on previous shows we've demonstrated how to do that. But what if you have a lot of plants and you don't know where to, what, where to protect them. Well, this is a structure that you can use. It's called an overwintering structure that's very inexpensive and very simple to build. So let me show you how to do that. First thing you want to do before you build it is to figure out how many plants you have that need to be protected. Get them all crowded in together so you can figure out how big a space you're going to need. Now in this overwintering structure, it's a very simple design using these conduit metal pipe hoops. Now you could also use flexible PVC and, and create that hoop-like effect. Now that's very important because we're going to create a layer of air that acts as an insulator when the weather gets very cold and that's what protects the plants. It's not the covering that we put on it. One of the ways that you secure the the piping or the tubing is with rebar and you drive rebar down in the ground and this becomes the spike by which that you can take the PVC or the conduit pipe and put it on there and you can see here there are three it's about eight or nine feet long and about six feet wide so you've got quite a bit of space and now what are you going to do to create that layer of air that air insulation because folks that's what really protects these plants and specifically the roots from freezing when it gets real cold well, what, what's recommended is a polyethylene plastic, but not just any polyethylene plastic. It's got to be opaque. It cannot be translucent so sun can come in because you're going to get quite a bit of heating during the day if you use something like that. A white plastic does a couple of things. It reflects more light and therefore will moderate the temperature, but it also insulates and holds in the warm air and the radiant heat that comes from the ground. You're basically going to drape this over, and I'll go ahead and demonstrate. You know, be, you want to leave it open when the weather's mild so you don't have a buildup of heat inside the overwintering structure. But when you know it's going to get cold and get down below 32 and even down into the teens and single digits, it's really important to, to go ahead and cover this even late in the mid-afternoon so you can get some, some buildup of, of heat. But here we'll go ahead and cover it down. And then, of course, it's very important, especially when it gets windy, to secure the plastic using cinder blocks or heavy, anything heavy uh, uh, that'll keep that plastic from blowing off. So, folks, here's an inexpensive, easy way to overwinter your plants. Good insulation when it gets real cold. A great way to keep those plants, bring them out in the springtime, get them planted, and take the others that go on your patio and decorating areas in the containers and grow from there. Well, remember, some of the benefits of having your own home greenhouse is that you can propagate more plants and that you've got a place to work even when it's not so nice outside. So I thought what we would do is talk about just sowing some seeds, some vegetable garden seeds, and also propagating some plants from cuttings. So when we get started here, we've got a, a seed tray as it would be. It's a very shallow tray that has drainage that's filled with media. And you can see this is a, a, uh, a pasteurized media for growing plants in. And what we're going to do is sow some cilantro seeds. Now cilantro seeds, pretty easy for us to show because they're, they're quite large. You can see the size of them here. And we're going to go ahead and sow these seeds and get them ready um, for planting. And I'll show you what we'll do with them. So there are a number of different ways that you can actually sow these seeds. What I like to do is just sprinkle them lightly on the soil surface and take them, make sure that they're not touching each other. You might think, well, shouldn't you be burying them in the soil? Well, folks, one of the biggest mistakes that people make when they plant seeds, whether they be in small pots or in the ground or in, in seed flats like this, is we plant them too deep. We don't plant them shallow enough because a lot of seeds require light in order to germinate. There, I think we've got all the cilantro seeds. We've got it pretty well spread out. And you might be saying, well, do you just leave them on the soil surface? No, what you need to do is just take a little bit of potting soil and lightly cover those seeds. So what I've got here is just some more potting soil and another smaller pot and I'm making sure that the seeds can't be seen. 
but we don't want to go with any more than about an eighth of an inch of soil on top of those seeds because they'll set roots down into that seed bed and they'll grow just fine. One of the biggest problems if you plant them too deep, they don't get enough light and as a result they, you get incomplete germination. In other words, not all the seeds will germinate, only the ones that are closer to the soil surface. Now that looks just about right. Now the only thing I like to do after that is just tamp it a little bit with the back of my hand to secure everything together. And then you could have watered before, but I always like to water afterwards. So with a watering can, you take your water and lightly water the, the seed bed. And of course, you want to water it until it's completely saturated. And for demonstration purposes, I'm not going to stay here all afternoon and water, but you can get the idea. You want to go ahead and get a good saturation so that the water is draining out the bottom of the container. And then when you're finished, one of the things that... You have to remember about propagating from seed in a greenhouse is you don't want to leave it out like this. You actually want to provide a little bit more humid environment for it. So we're going to take it, we're going to put it under this crate. And this is something that Helen showed me earlier today, is you take the seed bed, put it under the crate, put the crate over it, and even though the greenhouse has high relative humidity, we want to have even higher relative humidity. So what we're going to do is take more of that polyethylene plastic, the white plastic, and place it over the top like this. Now what that does is help to create a more humid environment and stimulate those seeds to grow. Again, you might provide some ventilation, but remember this greenhouse is ventilated and that'll keep the temperature down in there. So that's about it with the seeds. As they begin to grow up, you can transplant them into your garden and you're ready to go with the cilantro. Now let's talk about cutting propagation. It's a vegetative propagation, and you might say, well, in the wintertime, what can you do? Well, there's something called hardwood cutting propagation. And if you look, some might say, well, you've just got a bunch of sticks in your hand. Well, these are, these are stems from a wigilia, a wigilia florida rubidor. It's a yellow-leafed, red-flowering wigilia that I cut this morning. And over here, I've got some hibiscus. This is called bluebird hibiscus, hibiscus seriacus bluebird. These are two deciduous shrubs that actually grow very well and can be propagated by what we call hardwood cuttings. So what I've got here is a, is a, a, a series of pots with soil in it that we're going to go ahead and use to stick our hardwood cuttings. The basic idea here is you would cut these in late fall or winter and with your pruners cut uh, deciduous stem lengths of about four to six inches, like so. Take each one of those, and you want to clean up that bottom as well. Dip it in a rooting hormone at the bottom. Here I've got a rootone, rooting hormone, and stick that into the container like so. It's that simple. And the other thing you always want to make sure you do with seeds or with cuttings is to label your cuttings. Now here I've put Wigilia Florida Rubidor, and I put the date on it when they were when they were stuck, and so that'll go here. So then I'll go ahead and take one cutting here of uh, my uh, hibiscus, put it down in the rooting hormone, put it here, put my tag. I'll repeat that halfway through for the hibiscus, also for the wigilia. Folks, when it's done, it can't stay in the greenhouse. These root better when they are in a colder location. So I would take this and go and put it in the cold frame or on the north side of the house insulated with pine straw or with some wheat straw. But that's how simple hardwood cuttings can be. By springtime, these will be rooted. You'll be able to go ahead and either pop them up into bigger pots or plant them in the garden. Well, our plan of the week this week was suggested to us from our very own Helen Krauss. We've spent all day in her greenhouse and she suggested Salvia elegans, pineapple sage. Helen, we're going to give you an In the Garden t-shirt and folks, remember if you send in a suggestion to the website and we use it on the air, we'll send you an In the Garden t-shirt as well. Well, let's talk about pineapple sage because Helen says it's one of her favorite plants and I can see why. This is a typical salvia. It has leaves and flowers, but this is a, a 
tender perennial, more like an annual in North Carolina. It comes originally from Mexico, and this particular plant has heart-shaped leaves and bright red flowers that really attract butterflies and hummingbirds. Folks, if you want hummingbirds in your garden, you've got to get a pineapple sage. But the real neat thing about pineapple sage, in addition to the flowers, are the leaves. If you rub the leaves just slightly, or maybe even brush up against the plant, it smells just like pineapples, and that's a real conversation piece for the garden. Well, this particular plant loves full sun and a well-drained soil. Remember, it's going to grow quite a bit during the growing season, but if you want to keep it for the next year, you'll have to take cuttings and go ahead and put it in a greenhouse or in your home and grow it inside. But it's a great plant of the week, Salvia elegans pineapple sage. Well, folks, we've had a great time here with Helen in her greenhouse. We want to thank her for letting us visit, but we're out of time. So until next week, I'll be looking for you in the garden. To register for In the Garden, the course, call NC State's Distance Education Program at 1-866-GO-STATE. That's 1-866-467-8283. Or log on to distance.ncsu.edu. For more information about the program or to suggest a plant of the week, go to unctv.org slash in the garden. Funding for In the Garden is provided by UNC TV members and by Academic Programs and North Carolina Cooperative Extension. Both are members of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at North Carolina State University.